Hey everyone, and welcome to this video on natural language processing. Unlike other videos that I've been trying to be as succinct as possible and to the point and brief, this one is more kind of my personal history of natural language processing. So I began working in computational linguistics, natural language processing back in the early 90s. Uh, that's when I got my PhD. And then I did a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh Linguistics Department, then worked at IBM on speech recognition. And then for the bulk of my career, I worked in machine translation. So I've kind of spanned decades <laughs> of natural language processing and seeing the transition in the field. And my story really begins in 2003 with a broken bus in Mexico. So I was attending a computational linguistics conference in Mexico City. And this conference was organized kind of a bit differently than most traditional conferences. So there'd be a day of traditional conference with talks by various people. And then we'd alternate that with going, getting in a bus and going somewhere, like seeing the pyramids in Mexico City, or getting on this bus and going to get on this open air kind of truck. This might be common for people who do kind of field work, <laughs> but for computational linguists who sit at at a desk all day, you know, this was kind of a novel experience for us. Get on a bus, go up this kind of narrow mountainy pass to see the monarch butterfly. So that's really pretty much what the conference was like, a day of conference and a day of exploring. And the thing about these buses is that they broke down a lot. So there we'd be, we'd be stranded somewhere, a bunch of computational linguists standing at the side of the road, sometimes for hours, and we'd be waiting there in the middle of nowhere in Mexico. And it's here that I had my kind of fundamental shift in the direction of my research. And that shift pretty much mirrors the shift in general in natural language processing and in artificial intelligence. So it was there that I struck up this conversation with Eric Brill, who at that time was at Microsoft. And he was really well known, especially at the time, for inventing a new algorithm to do part of speech tagging. And here's an example of part of speech tagging. So what we want to do with part of speech tagging is tag each word with its part of speech. So the is a determiner, lazy is an adjective, dog is a noun, slept is a past tense verb. And if we just took the most probable tag, part of speech tag for each word, we'd be at about 90% accurate. So these algorithms would just kind of get somewhere between 90%, which is do the most likely one, to 100%. So that's kind of the range we're playing with in algorithms. And why this is important is this reason that in machine translation, for example, we would translate the verb run from the noun run differently. So we run three miles daily is translated, that word run is translated differently from the run was three miles. So an example of this would look like this. So we're just taking some text and as we encounter each word, we're tagging that word with its part of speech. And the general approach was this, that we would collect a corpus, so we just get a whole slew of text. We'd have human experts tag the corpus by hand. As you can imagine, we'd have to have multiple people coding the same thing and then compare how accurate they were. So did they agree on these tags? And once we had that, which was fairly labor intensive, we could train the system, some algorithm using this corpus. And finally, we can use it to tag new text. So pretty similar to kind of what we've been doing so far in this course. And the previous algorithms were 96% accurate. Remember, just picking the most likely one was 90%. And the Brill algorithm was 97%. So a 1% accuracy led him to get his PhD and led him to become famous in natural language processing. So 1% difference had a huge impact on his life and the field. Let's look at a related task, which is disambiguation. So here the task isn't to label it with part of speech, but that sometimes words that look alike, that are spelled the same way, actually mean different things. Like the word bank can mean different things. And again, this is important to understand because in machine translation, we'd want to translate these words differently. So the pilot tried to bank the plane, is translated in Spanish differently, that word bank. Then we picnicked on the bank of the Rio Grande, which again is translated differently that, uh, from I need to go to the bank later today. So that's the disambiguation task. And there's a number of algorithms that can back then in the 2000s that did this task. And the general approach again was we collect a corpus, we manually tag the corpus, so human experts 
<laughs> sounds kind of weird, human experts, but experts would tag the corpus, then we'd use that tagged corpus to train our system. And here's the results from way back from the 2000s, so 2001, where we have these five different algorithms and how they performed. And they don't look all that different, so let me cheat and change, instead of going from 0 to 100 on the graph, let me change it to 77 to 85, so you can really see that there are some differences, right? So it pays if, if, the, you know, if the field only had up to the green bar, it'd pay to be working hard and trying to develop that gray algorithm. But let's look at this in a little more detail. So here on the far left, we see the performance of these algorithms. So the gray algorithm is really good. It outperforms all others when we train on one million words. So what's more, where should we devote our time? Should we devote our time to trying to come up with a better algorithm? Or should we devote our time to collecting more data? And that's what this chart is showing. So if you look over here, at if we collected 10 million words, you can see that even the worst algorithm, the blue one, outperforms the best one trained in 1 million words. Let me say that again. So the worst algorithm trained on 10 million words outperforms the best algorithm that was only trained on 1 million words. So more data is more critical than better algorithms. And you can see the same thing occur between the 10 million corpus and the 100 million corpus. That again, the worst algorithm of at the 10 million will outperform, when you train it on 100 million words, will outperform the best algorithm at the 10 million words. What this chart's showing then is that it's always better to collect more data, <laughs> or it looks like it is. That has more impact than tweaking algorithms. But you can't get a PhD for collecting data. That's kind of the disadvantage, and you can for coming up with an algorithm that you know just barely outperforms another. So this was a huge transformation in the field once we started learning about this. And it's a way, getting away from hand-coding knowledge and improving algorithms, all those are important. But the focus then began to be on acquiring more data. So at the time of that broken down bus, I was working at NMSU, New Mexico State University, which was one of the two leading academic greenhouses for machine translation development in the U.S., according to this issue of Wired Magazine. So we were really one of the main shops for machine translation, academic shops for machine translation. And we really worked with symbolic AI. That was our strength. And what that meant was this, that so we had native speakers, sometimes graduate students we'd hire, or sometimes speakers in various countries. And we also had a, a wide range of field linguists who would ask these people, these informants, questions about how their language works. And then from there, we have these linguists and both field linguists and theoretical linguists would come up with rules. The computational linguists would then develop the rules into a form that computers could use. And that's how we built these systems. So here's an example. So we'd ask a native speaker of English, can you say the red flower? And they'd say, sure, that's a good sentence or a good noun phrase. And what about the flower red? No, that's not good. So we're going to kind of cross that out, show it's not good. The big red flower, yep, that's a fine noun phrase. The flower, yep, no problem. Flower the, no, that's not good. So you get a trained linguist can kind of extract this information from native speakers and come up with a rule like that shown on the right, that a noun phrase consists of a determiner, followed by one or more adjectives, followed by a noun. And we do that for all the different kind of rules that we would need for what are the rules for a verb phrase, whether the verb rule... What are the rules for sentences? And so on. And as you can imagine, this takes a humongous amount of time and a lot of expertise with field linguists to kind of extract these things. Because people will probably say you can't have an adjective following a noun like the flower red in English, right? That's fine in Spanish, but not so great in English. But there are some adjectives that do follow nouns in English. For example, there were tulips galore or he was a professor emeritus, or no real person would ever stand with his arms akimbo. So there the adjectives are following the noun. So we'd have to extract this information, figure out what are the rules here that allow this. It was a very labor-intensive process. So we employed lots and lots of people who got PhDs in very specific areas of linguistics, Armenian, Chinese, Korean. So the lab was filled with these human experts. So pre-Mexico trip, I focused on helping these linguists encode various facts about language. So that was kind of machine translation based on rules. After the trip, 
I started focusing on what information I could get automatically from large collections of text. And this is a name of a talk given by Peter Norvig, the head of research at Google. It's just a cool name, <laughs> so I stuck with it. ABC easy is one, two, three, really meaning, hey, what information can we get from text just by doing simple things like counting? So for example, Frederick Jelinek is famous for saying, every time I fire a linguist, the performance of my speech recognizer goes up. Frederick Jelinek says he never said that, <laughs> but yet he's famous for saying it, so who knows? Anyway, so the idea would be that we're going to just count and see if we can do machine translation by counting. And let's take this very simple example. So I have this English sentence, those who lie down with the dog get fleas. And I have it Spanish translation. And now we want to know, let's say we don't know Spanish, we want to know what is the Spanish word that means dog. So, well, it could be maybe any word in that sentence. So I list them on the left there, right? So it can be any one of those, suppose. All right, so then we get another sentence. When I feed a dog and it bites me, then I will not feed it anymore because otherwise it may bite me again. And it's Spanish translation. Now I can see, well, some of those words that occurred in the first sentence didn't occur in the second, even though the word dog did. So I can kind of narrow down my search for what is the word for dog, and I get three possibilities here. And we go find another sentence with the word dog in it. And there we get, I am sure the president and office of the consul is a very nice man and is very kind to his wife and his children and his dog. Again, I get the Spanish translation. And now I really narrowed it down and said, you know, hey man, it's likely that the word perro in Spanish is the word for dog. So that's kind of really pretty rough of how we go about doing some statistical work. I'm gloaming over <laughs> avoiding all the difficulties, but that's basically it. So it's easy as counting. It's a little more complex, but let's just say it's pretty easy. And the idea is that if the English sentence is, five, we find 500 English sentences with the word dog in it, and in the Spanish translations, 450 of them have perro, only 100 have un, presidente, whereas an eight, gato, seven. The likelihood that perro is the translation of dog is pretty great, right? So it's a pretty simple example. The problem comes, and there are many others, but we get that sometimes one word in English gets translated into two words in Spanish, like watchdog goes to those two words, poodle goes to three words, and sometimes the reverse is true, that multiple word things in English will go to one word in the other language, in this case Spanish. So that's basically, I mean, I'm avoiding again a lot of complexity, I don't want to make it seem trivial, but that's the basic idea, that we're doing you know, at least the first step is counting a lot of things. So instead of human experts writing rules, we have informants translate their native texts into English. Then we have this kind of bilingual corpus of a sentence in their language and translated into English. For example, when we did a translation system for Guarani, the official language of Paraguay, here's the some text in Guarani. We couldn't find really any reliable Guarani to English speakers, so we first had some experts translated into Spanish, the middle part. And then we had that Spanish translated into English. Now we have pairs, or triplets really, but we can use these to do a machine translation system that build, can be built automatically rather than relying on human experts. One thing we need to do in initially is divide the sentence into tokens or words. So that might be a first step. Here it seems pretty easy. There's some little gotchas always <laughs> in doing this work. But for the most part, we can divide by spaces. And that's called segmentation. Dividing a string into words is called segmentation. And you can see that in some languages, it's not as trivial as doing it in English or Spanish. So here we have Javanese, Thai, and Tibetan all have some interesting properties of doing um, segmentation. And it's going to be hard to give a little talk about these Javanese, Thai, Tibetan, because we don't have any intuitions about them as Eng native English speakers. So let me move on to really talking about segmentation of English, even though we don't need to do it very often. But if you look at these, you can see that as native English speakers, we don't have any problem whatsoever kind of segmenting it up and dividing it into understandable words. How we might have a computer do it is, well, we could look at all the possible segmentations and then pick the most probable. So we get that phrase that I show here, and that has 17 billion possible splits. 
then we just arbitrarily or look at all the possible segmentations, compute the probability of those sentences. So what's the probability of the word HO followed by the word wither, followed by the word oot, and so on, and we get 10 to the negative 32. That's not such a probable English sentence. And we get number two there, how the gut microbiota affects sour health. That's been much, much better. We, and that's 10 to the negative 27 probability. And how the gut mic, the third one, how the gut microbiota affects our health is really the best, and that's the probability shown there. So this seems reasonable, but as you can imagine, the catch is, you know, trying to compute this for 17 billion possible splits on such a short sentence. So trying to do something in a huge text in a book that's 90,000 words long, that would be pretty computationally intractable. Peter Norvig came up with this program. It's a simple Python program, and you can see it's pretty short. I'm not going over it, but um, I implemented it, or just ran it, <laughs> I guess, and it works pretty well. So Virginia Academy of Science meeting comes out correctly. Guide to data mining also comes out well. So here we found a way of just basic counting. Instead of doing that splitting in probability stuff, we can do, there's even an easier method. And there's zero use. There's a lot of use for it in other languages that don't have segmentation. But even in English, if we stretch it, and the, these are examples from Peter Norvig, the again the director of research at Google. They're not my examples. This particular slide is, but maybe we could use it for dividing up URLs. So guide to datamining.com. You know, we can read that fine, even though there's no division between the words. And maybe it'd be helpful, so if we're coming up with a fantastic name for a website, we could use a program like this to make sure we're not making any dumb mistakes. So here's an example. So this is a real website name. And that is Choose Spain. So it's a site to help in traveling to Spain, encourage travel to Spain. There's an actual site. This site actually exists or did exist when I wrote made these slides. And that's a therapist finder site. So again, this might be useful because we could see other possible, maybe we're kind of have blinders on and don't see the other readings of these things. This is Pen Island. It sells fine quality custom pens. This is experts exchange. So experts can exchange information about different topics and categories. That's speed of art, just some information about different arts, some promotions, various aspects of art. And this is Via Graphics, a graphics development site, software division, designing stuff, software and computer training. This is PowerGen Italia, an electronics site. So as you can see, as some of these humorous examples show, you know, there can be some basic counting that have useful purposes. And that one page program I showed is about 98% accurate, so pretty phenomenally accurate. So we're seeing kind of the power of counting, and it also shows the power of big data. The code can be very small, the power lies in all that data. And it's kind of the intersection of math and language that everything's based really on counting. So whether you're looking at Siri, Amazon, Echo, Google Voice, Google Translate, IBM Watson, all these things involve basic mathematics of counting and computing probabilities or computing something related to counting stuff. So let me give you one more example. And this is question answering. And question answering was a competition among labs. It was called the NIST track question answering track. And this began in 1992. So labs would compete and be ranked and what I'm going to talk about is the 2001 competition. So the corpus of a Trek question answering year might be a corpus in at least in 2001 was 1 million documents, 3 gigabytes of text. That sounds like a pretty big corpus. And the task was you get a question in English and you had to return 50 characters containing the answer. So search through all those 1 million documents and find the 50 words that answer the question. So some sample questions are these. 
What does the Peugeot company manufacture? Who's the managing director of Apricot Computer? What is the name of the rare neurological disease with symptoms such as involuntary movements, swearing, and incoherent vocalizations? And the best system answered about 70% of the questions. It was pretty difficult to answer these back then. I mean, we were really working hard at perfecting algorithms. And these systems required a huge amount of effort. So 100,000 to 300,000 source lines of code, easy. Required dozens of programmers to work. So these labs would be, you know, have huge teams working on this task. It would just take years and years of effort to develop these systems and compete year to year. So here's a system developed by Language Computer Corporation back in Dallas, Texas. And it was one of the main, the big systems back then. Our lab worked on some components of this, the machine translation part, not shown in all these little boxes. And as you can see, I'm not going to describe every little box that you can see where it would take a huge team to develop all this stuff. If you just pause a moment and look at all these things, you'd think, yeah, you know, it's a fairly complex thing. And the reason for all these complexities is if we get a query like who killed Abraham Lincoln, and the Trek Corpus had John Wilkes Booth altered history with a bullet, he will be forever be known as the man who ended Abraham Lincoln's life. There's a lot of reasoning that would need to go on in a system, right, to figure out that someone that ended Abraham Lincoln's life was, is kind of the same thing as killed, and that he will, be, he will be forever known as the man who ended refers back to John Wilkes Booth, so you get the answer, John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln. So there's a lot of inferencing and knowledge of language that would be required. So again, that best system answered about uh, or uh, slightly over 70% of the questions. Huge, huge effort. But let's say we're not interested in developing the best system. Let's say we're only interested in developing a pretty good system. And instead of all that time, which seems like a drag to spend all those years of development, let's say we just want to work a weekend. So I can probably rough out a thousand source lines of code in a weekend pretty easily. And you don't need a dozens of programmers for that. You just get a couple. And let's just work on a weekend and slog together some system. How well could we do in this competition? That's the query. And that's the, a query Eric Brill, again him, <laughs> of sitting at the side of the road in Mexico, you know, he was involved in this system. So the Trek Corpus was three gigabytes, as I mentioned, a million documents. And I said that sounds huge. But even back in 2002, the web was humongous, 200 terabytes of information. That's 60,000 times more than this Trek Corpus. That's the key to how a thousand source lines of code can do well. So the Trek Corpus kind of would look like this if it was in book form. And the task would be find a paragraph in one of these books that answers the question, right? So that would be the find the book in all these shelves that would answer this question. In contrast, the web was this big. If we lined up those shelves all along my trip from Virginia to New Mexico, that would be about the size of how much information was on the web back then, a whole lot. So there's a tremendous more, we said 60,000 times more information on the web. So instead of this, where we're trying to connect who killed Abraham Lincoln to that little bit of text in the Trek Corpus, we can go search the web. We can say, get rid of that who may be in search for killed Abraham Lincoln. We find some entries. Why John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln, or John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln and was himself killed, and the bullet that killed Abraham Lincoln. So not every sentence has John Wilkes Booth in it, but the majority of them do. The majority can win, and we found our answer on the web. So we, the approach might be we would transform the question. So who killed Abraham Lincoln might go just to killed Abraham Lincoln. And then we search Google. And then we get the search results. We process using a few heuristics. So for example, if we say who, we would expect a name. So bullet's not a name. So we would kind of rule that out. So we get some answers. So we'd have a little bit of logic in our thousand lines of code. And then we search the Trek corpus for the combined question and answer. So John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln, or John Wilkes Booth, Abraham Lincoln. And we find that little 50-word subset of, of the answer. And how did this do? Well, it placed 6 out of 40. So 39 systems, people were spending, you know, there were dozens and dozens of people involved in each of those 39 systems, years and years of effort. And this one was just a 1,000 lines of code on a weekend, and it played 6th. So pretty impressive. 
So in the early days of question answering, these systems made mistakes. Mistakes were made. And here's just some examples of them. So the question was, where do lobsters like to live? And one system answered, on a Canadian airline. Why are zebras, sorry, where are zebras most likely found? One system said, in a dump, and another said, in a dictionary. Why can't ostriches fly? A system said, because of American economic sanctions. That's kind of a bummer. And what is the population of Mexico? That's simple, it's three. And what can trigger an allergic reaction? Pfft, something that can trigger an allergic reaction. So you can see that these systems back then weren't perfect. The systems now are tremendously super improved, right? We can ask a question of Alexa or some other system and get a great answer. Or maybe not a great answer, but at least better than because of economic sanctions. So that's really the power of big data. Right, So we're looking at, before where human experts would have to write rules, we didn't have gobs and gobs of bar any text on the web, we had to talk to people and come up with the rules of languages, and now we see that you know, just increasing more, the data size can improve the performance tremendously. And that's really part of that big bang in machine learning that I've already talked about, that we have big data, we have machines that can you know, process this big data in a reasonable time, and while I kind of disparaged algorithms in this talk, really there's been a tremendous improvement in algorithms. So everything goes hand in hand here, but big data is really the big driver there. So that was it. Uh, that was the little off topic, slightly personal history of natural language processing for me, but it mirrors how things are in the field, right? We started with kind of symbolic AI where experts were writing rules, kind of expert systems, and moving on to this deep learning method where we're relying on lots and lots of data. And in closing, I'd like to point out something that uh, this person, Jaron Lanier, said. He's kind of a visionary, a super well-known person in kind of artificial intelligence, vision, just the whole area, you know, just a phenomenal person in computer science. And there's some kind of connection to, <laughs> and there's a bit of a connection to NMSU, to New Mexico State University, in that he lived in the desert there in Las Cruces, New Mexico, in a yurt. So kind of an interesting uh, character. So um, what he said was, we're really, the, he was concerned about the ethics of all this, which is that to make a machine translation system, to make a deep learning machine translation system, requires text that is translated by humans, right? So we have an English, a French text, let's say, and but human translators have spent, you know, their time to translate it into English. Or we have some Guarani text, human translators have spent, right, spent lots and lots of time translating it to English. So these systems are built on the shoulders of these human experts, true with any work we're looking at. There are many people employed as translators, and now that number has really dwindled. So it's really unfortunate that, you know, these machines require, it's like having to train your successor, right? So you have to train the new person and you're going to get fired. And this is kind of the unfortunate ethical dilemma we have in machine learning, especially when it comes to language. So I just wanted to point that out before moving on to the cool aspects of things, that there is kind of this dirty, you know, unethical part of the work we're doing. So in the next video, I'm going to talk more specifically about how to do deep learning for natural language processing, and we'll go from there. So I hope this was sort of entertaining and at least some sort of introduction that contains some useful information for you. See you in the next video. Bye.